Welcome to Via the Grapevine, proudly brought to you by Tony De Costa of Liquor City Claremont and offering you the chance to learn more about wine, the masters behind them, and even which wines to collect. Very excited today to commence 2021 with uh, some very, very cool guests. Uh, today I'm joined by Spicer de Villiers. Uh, he's the guy with the hair, uh, son of owners Gerard and Libby, and uh, Rainy Oosthuizen, winemaker. Uh, and they're from one of the most intriguing wine estates nestled in the Blauklippen Valley on the slopes of the Helderberg Mountain outside Stellenbosch, the premier red wine area in the Cape. And I speak, of course, of, you can see it on the screen, Kleinoit, home of Tambours Kloof wines. Welcome, gents. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Uh, Spicer, let's start with the name of the farm versus the name of the wine produced. It might cause some confusion for some people. They, uh, they go and look in uh, the books and they go, oh, claim to it. Oh, and then it says, see Tambourskloof wines. <laughs> Why the name Tambourskloof? It's a long story, but I'll, I'll keep it short for you. Um, basically, wh wh where it all started was, was we were living in Tambourskloof, Cape Town, as a family. And um, my parents bought the farm, which at that stage had zero infrastructure. So we slowly but surely started planting the vines and, and uh, building the winery and everything else. And it reached the point where the winery was completed, um, but uh, the, the, the grapes weren't where we wanted them to be yet. And we'd already decided to name the farm Kleinwit, um, which means something small and precious, which is, it certainly is. Um, and uh, so we didn't want to name the, 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 the wine that we, was, we were producing at that stage after the estate because we were buying in grapes. We were still living in Tambushkloof at that stage with no houses built on the farm. So we decided to call it Tambushkloof, the wine. Um, and that, that went on for a couple of years and, and uh, as, as our vineyards matured and, and started producing the quality grapes we were looking for. Um, and during that period, we managed to open up a couple of markets internationally and obviously locally. And then after three, four years down the line, we went to our exporters and our distributors and we said, listen, we're going to change the name now. And they said, no, you're not. So, so now we are Clenwood Farm and uh, we make Tambuskluf wines and it's, it's a nice way of, 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 of paying homage to where we're from and, and where the dream started in Tambuskluf and Cape Town. Um, yep. But it's, it's, it is a bit of a Dimakar spill, it's a bit, <laughs> to be honest. I've got to tell you, to be honest, when I first, because uh, I moved to Cape Town in the year 2000 from KZN and the first place I lived was Tambuskluf and I was always passionate about wine. And uh, I think the first time I saw the label, I was like, but where, but where in Tambuskloof is this farm? It must be like a really <laughs> boutique winery, this. And I, was, I looked around Tambuskloof and I asked people, no, there's no wine farm here. No, no, no. Um, so, yes, it, 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 it's, I mean, it's a phenomenal label that you've got there. But, of course, there's more meaning to the word Tambuskloof. It doesn't mean that you have to stay in the suburb of Tambuskloof because the, the word itself has got meaning related to the, uh, the Dutch sectors, doesn't it? Uh, the, the drum that was used to communicate when ships arrived. And, and, I, and, and I believe there was one that was situated in your area. Of yes, Cinema. so on, on the, the whole of, of, of all of the mountains surrounding, surrounding Cape Town and even coming out into the Bulland, there were these um, drums situated and uh, the call would go out. The first guys that would spot the boats would either be on, on, on Cape Point side, False Bay side, and the first guy to see them coming in would start beating the drum. And the drum beat would then circulate all around the Cape Peninsula and inland, um, calling farmers uh, to, to bring their fresh produce to, to the docks. So it's, a, it's, it's a conceptually a nice way of, of, of highlighting that connection between all the different spots around the Cape Peninsula and inland um, with, with the beat of a drum. So Klenwood's focus is on specializing in the production of, of only a, a, a Syrah-based red wine, a small production of Viennere uh, and Syrah Rosé, uh, as well as uh, de Bourne, uh, 
virgin, extra virgin olive oil. We must talk about that uh, a little later on. Uh, but I, I'm sure I saw somewhere that you that you also grow Moverde and Rasan. Is that is that right? Are, are the choice of cultivars grown uh, a terroir-driven decision for you, Rainy? Well, obviously that decision was made slightly before I joined the farm. I joined the farm in 2018. But yes, when the decision was made, it's completely regarding uh, soil type, climate. Um, obviously, you, you have to take into consideration the market at a certain, to a certain extent. But as you said, we specialize in, 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 in the Rhone varieties. And when, when Farad bought the farm, he did all the, all the, he collected all the data um regarding the soil type uh, regarding the the sun ra the radiation the temperature the wind conditions the moisture in the soil etc and and from there we we planted 23 blocks on the farm of which four are, are olives um and then the rest are planted according to what what the soil predominantly um uh, told us we should plant um, and, and climatically we're very close to the Rhone um, except that we don't get the Mistral like they do in, in, in the south of France we get the, Cop, uh, the Cape Doctor or the South Easter um, which has a very big influence on the upper, upper Black Lippen Valley um, when, when the South Easter um, starts to blow it comes down the valley and, and it gives us this very nice cooling effect and um, so, so that obviously helps, helps a lot with, with, with grape quality. It helps to cool it down, especially in these February days where it goes bordering 40 or above 40. Um, and then so, so, so the Mavert is planted very close to the Roussan. Both, both are planted on a slightly more sandy soil. Um, and and we, we created a, a small um, batch of, of Mavert the, this year. Oh, last year, mm. 2019, we released, and it's a very light in style, and, and, and 2,000 bottles. And then the Roussan mostly goes into, into our Viognier. So the Viognier is 15% uh, Roussan, give or take a few digits every vintage. Um, but it, it just adds texture. And I love, I love Rhone varieties. Most of them add some nice texture to the wine. So yeah, that, that's a so long answer to your short question. No, not at all. So that's quite interesting. Then you're saying that you you have added um, Muverde to your to your lineup of of cultivars. Is that correct? It's not just you've you've got a as you said a single bottling. Is this something that that you see going forward? Um, if if it allows, it, it, yeah, it, it can, allowing the vintage. Um, Muverde okay. Muverde is um, very temperamental. One year it would be fully extracted and um, inky in color, and the next you would find it's quite light in color. The reason for us releasing the, we call it the Mia Faller, um, is because it's, it's every, every, every so often you, you, get it, you get a wine that stands out. Um, usually mm -hmm. we, we, we use most of it to add to our Tambushkla of Syrah blend. Um, so it's, it's a Syrah Mavad Vunier, but in, in small quantities. So we, we actually gave the vineyard a little bit of TLC. Um, it is very, uh, it, it's very, it's, been, it's in a spot on the farm which is quite humid. So that gives the, the vineyard um, actually gets a little bit of wood rotting disease. And we've completely restructured the permanent structure of the vines. And um, that is giving us these big bunches, but nice extraction. So it, you have to come to the farm and, and, and look at these vineyards. They, they've got tant pain and um, us Afrikaans people like to be very, very, um, what's the word, later look? Um, literal. Literal, literal in, in, in our description. It, it pretty much looks like a, a jaw <laughs> with a couple of teeth that it's lost. Um, so we cut that down and retrained it. And, but, but our farm, I think, um, Spicer will agree with me, we we want people on the farm, we want them to experience it. And that's why we do these smaller runs of Mierfaller and, and we, mm. we did a little Roussan Viognier blend, with, which was predominantly Roussan. And, and that we sell from the tasting room and that's to get people here and to experience Kleinwood for what it is. It's this small and precious little spot in one of the most beautiful valleys in the world, I think. 
Beautiful. I, I believe that the uh, cultivars are each hand-picked as well and that you guys have got a real focus on sustainability in the vineyards. In terms of sustainability in the vineyards, what are some of the methods that, you, that you're employing? Um, one, of the, one of the most successful um, practices that, that we are doing in, in the vineyards is actually releasing natural predators instead of spraying pesticides, um, specifically for a bug called mealybug. Um, so when you came down from, from the Tal in 2000 and you drove through Stellenbosch for the first time in April and you saw these beautiful red and orange colors in the vineyards, that's mostly leaf roll virus, which is not a good thing to have in the vineyard. It, it just looks nice in the middle of April. Um, we I saw that in, in the Duins. Uh, a lot of that in the Duins Valley. If you go through the axe and you, see that, you, you yeah. see that as well. So it's a beautiful picture, um, but in the long term, it doesn't paint a pretty picture because it, your, your longevity of your vineyards they start to not photosynthesize at the right rate at coming at the end of vintage, so they don't build up reserves. So at a certain point, you then have to take out your vineyard. So we, we don't want to take out our vineyards. We've only got 10 hectares of that. So <laughs> we try and prevent the spread of leaf, leaf roll by releasing natural predators, little parasitic wasps and ladybirds, and they chow the mealybugs and make sure that we don't spread spread the virus too much. So we cut out any, any virus infected vines. And um, so instead of taking out a whole vineyard, we interplant and, and we try and regulate it in that way. So sustainability is not just one practice. It's the whole mindset of how you farm, how, many herb, how much herbicide or pesticide or fungicide you spray, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's more than just one, one thing. So, so on that, given the, the relative small size of the farm, uh, spice to this question for you would there be a move to organic farming in the future because it sounds like it could be relatively easy to to do of course then you've got to pay for all the licenses and the documents <laughs> <laughs> yes so i think i think for us it's it's, it's definitely we're tr something we're, we're trying to work as closely towards or towards as strongly as possible I think from a, from a farming point of view, it does change your, your farming dynamic in, in, in the long run. But even with, with the endemic and natural cover crops that we're planting and, and uh, insect hotels and owl houses and, and everything else that, that goes with, with, with the organic approach or working as closely as possible to the ecosystem and the environment that was here before us, um, we're, we're, we're very almost there. Um, I think, again, you, you mentioned documentation and, and audits and, and ticking very specific boxes that, uh, that, that in the process costs a lot of money. So that's something that we're exploring very, very strongly at the moment. And I think I want to hand this over to Rainy because at the end of the day, he, he farms the land. So, so Hector, just, I mean, I, I agree with organic farming principles. I, I, I agree with biodynamic farming principles. I was brought up to look after nature and I think that's why we, we put on this earth to be custodians of it and to be as sustainable as possible. But just to give you an example, a year like this year, we've had quite a lot of rain and the guys that are farming organically pretty much needed to spray every fifth or seventh day. So the amount of petrol that they have to drive out with their quad bikes through the vineyards starts to come to a point where I think is this truly sustainable? So, I mean, I'm opening up a can of worms that I probably mm -hmm. can't close, but I would rather put one spray of a fungicide, which is not going to destroy mother nature and spray every 14 days, than go through with a bike and spray every seven days. So, I mean, obviously there would be a lot of people that, that won't agree with me, but I'm not going to farm and spray like the what's that black eyed peas song DDT on the on the apples. I, I, I'm going to to use something that's not going to destroy Mother Nature, but which is going to give the best quality grapes and be sustainable out of a business point of view and an env environmental point of view. Because at the end of the day, that 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 it's sustainable if you if you you can still make money. That that's my opinion. Got you. And you're you're kind of lending. 
a uh, beautiful sense of an answer to my next question, which is really about your winemaking philosophy. So you've kind of answered that 50, 50 to 60 percent already, uh, because as we know, most of it starts in the vineyard. So thank you for that. But let's let's talk a little bit about uh, about the wine, which for some reason, mine, oh yeah, it's the virtual thing. You've got to hold it in front of you to see it. Otherwise, <laughs> it's there and no one knows it's there. Um, <laughs> it's like magic. That's ridiculous. Okay. So... Uh, yeah, give us a little bit of insight into into the your winemaking philosophy when it comes to this product in the cellar. So my my philosophy in wine starts from from a young age where why I love wine it's it's it goes with food. Um, food and wine should be one. Um, it's being a winemaker is not a career; it's a lifestyle, and and a, a good lifestyle is having good food and good wine. That's uh, that's my the core of my philosophy is when I produce wine, it yes, it should be fun to drink it outside on the patio on its own, but at the end of the day, it, it needs to it needs to turn a meal into a memory, um, and and I think wine has the ability to do that. Yes, the gin and tonic outside on Camps Bay uh, is, is beautiful, but but a proper wine around the table with your family and friends at your house it's, it is something that you will remember. Um, so that's, that's the, core, the core principles. And then just out of a technical point of view, uh, a, a wine is a good food wine when it has texture, when it has mid palate weight. And that's what I strive for. And it, it is coming from, from being a salad rat pretty much, um, evolving into some, someone who is really starting to enjoy it outside in the vineyards. I think it needs to start there. And, and that's pretty much what I am. I'm just the custodian of Kleinwood, making sure that the vineyards are sustainable again and, and producing the fruit. And when it comes into the winery, um, I, I don't necessarily agree with the minimal intervention um, approach. I, 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 I think you need to allow the grapes to express the terroir, yes but you need to do that correctly and, and clean. I, I, I want the wines to be clean and, and have soul and, and the, the hard work that goes into producing grapes needs to be expressed. Um, but at the same time, when people buy the wine and they open it up, it, it mustn't talk back. Um, if, if, you, if you understand what I mean there, it needs to be a clean wine. So those, mm. those are, that comes down to, to my, my philosophy in wine. Uh, and for those who don't know, you, you came from Riston Freire, which is a farm known for its cab salves and its Syrah. Um, and, and you're working now with Syrah full on. Do you, do you have Syrah coursing through your veins? Where did the fascination for this particular cultivar begin? You can see it kind of going through there, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the blood bank no, must I, love you, eh? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I've, I've always loved the variety. I think the first wine that I can remember very vividly is, is a Lord's Shiraz coming from the McGregor area. That's the first time, I think it was a 2003 or something. I was still at school. I was uh, <laughs> 15 or 16 years old. And, 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 and my, mom, my mom got me into loving wine and appreciating it. And she opened the bottle and I remember it very vividly. It had this nice spice to it. And, and from that day on, the spice has always intrigued me. Um, it's evolved into not just aiming for spice, but getting, getting all the different expressions from Shiraz. I mean, you can go from floral straight through to leather and tobacco with Shiraz mm. or Syrah. And, and that's what always intrigued me. I mean, coming from Rist and Fira, yes, Cabernet, but, but most of us enjoy drinking the Shiraz more um, because it's more accessible at an early age. Cabernet, you really have to age and you really have to work it um, properly and with experience that, that comes with Cab. Shiraz is much more forgiving. Um, it's, it's in the winery, you can add whole bunch, you can do whole berry, you can do conventional crushing. And, and each, each of those batches would give you a different expression um, of the terroir. It, it, it is a really, really nice variety to work with. It's not finicky like Pinot Noir. It grows quite, quite vigorously in, in, on the Helderberg. Um, we've got these nice deep clay soils, so it just loves it and it, it soaks up all the moisture and it, and it gives you a, a, a wide variety of, of, of choices to make in the winery. And now 
look how your passion for spice has given you the opportunity to sit alongside Spicer. <laughs> I mean, just hey, that's the first time I've heard that joke. Well, before. first you compliment him on his good hair, and now you shoot him down with his name. Huh? How does that work? <laughs> look, uh, it's it's a very interesting name, Spicer de Villiers. I have to say, um, uh, primary school was tough. I can tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine. Yeah. I thought Guy was bad, but you. <laughs> no, Guy is pretty much the most normal one in this conversation because try and explain Rainy to an Englishman, um, and I'm coming from Reineke. It's also not an easy one. Yeah. What? You come from Reineke as well? No, I'm a, my, my full name's Reineke, so that's where oh, the right. name comes from. Yeah, no, no, I don't come from Reineke. Okay, sure. Then not I had you. to be organic. Eh? I had to be organic there. <laughs> I, I read that the, the cellar is quite a fascinating combination of traditional principles with some serious high-tech control and processes. Obviously, uh, your dad being an engineer, Spicer, that, 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 uh, that engineering background has really come into play. Can you, gents, give us some more insights on that, on that balance? Just as, you know, just out of interest, it's uh, how does the traditional and the, and, and the high-tech meld? I think from my side, uh, obviously, Rainy works the, 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 the winery a lot more than I do and gets to appreciate the equipment and the technology in place. Mm. But uh, just from my side, I think uh, it's uh, my father, having been an engineer and designed wineries for so many different clients in the past, you, you kind of, uh, I have the same coming from a marketing point of view, where you pitch these ideas that, that conceptually are incredibly exciting and then maybe there's not budget available or the client doesn't buy into it and you kind of hold that, you hold on to those ideas you write them down in the back of a notebook and and this this winery has in that sense brought a lot of those small little things to life including where we do our malolactic fermentation and the rail that runs on the roof to to uh, and i, I want to let rainy talk about that a little no bit. so it, it it's for me, it makes my job so much easier working for a boss like Kara. I mean, he's open to, to optimizing and, and making sure everything runs very effective. Um, coming also from an engineering background, growing in a, up in a house of, of my, with my dad being an engineer, I tried studying engineering for four years as well. And um, luckily, luckily shifted to, to the right pathway. But um, for, for, my, for my own sanity's sake, but, but coming from that mindset, it's, it's, it's really nice to work with, with a winery that was designed to be optimally run. Um, I've got three people permanently working in the winery. Um, we do 100 tons of grapes, and it's just the three of us. Everything cleans easily. Everything um, just runs so much smoother. And I never walk into the winery and feel, geez, this is a monotonous job. I am wasting time. Everything is very effective. And that what it, that's what it comes down to. So, yes, it's traditional in the sense, I mean, winemaking is very easy. Winemaking is take grapes, put it in a container, and make it ferment. That is, that it was, that's what it comes down to. But, but it's just easy to control the temp temperature automatically. The punch downs are done with a pneumatic punch down um, or jolsting stick. <laughs> I call it my jolsting stick. So, so I come in at night at 10 and I can punch down all the tanks by myself. I don't have an intern sitting over a tank for half an hour with a pump over. So it's all okay. those little things that just make it so much easier. And at the end of the day, that gives you a better quality because you can focus on the product and not just the process. So it's, it sounds like it. And, that, and that's exactly it. A nice, clean, slick working environment gives you the opportunity mentally to be more creative and to try different approaches. Exactly. Let's get to the best part of Via the Grapevine for me, and that's the tasting. Uh, today we're tasting the 2016 Tambours Kluf. Now I've got, to, I've got to hold it up in front of my shirt so we can see the label. <laughs> there it is, and in my head, and oh, I don't know if I like this virtual <laughs> thing, eh? <laughs> um, oh yes, thank you. There we go. Now we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the, the, the first thing I want to actually need, to, I'll be remiss if I don't address this, is the little lamaki, the sheep that is 
not on the front of the of the label, but it is on the back. It's in the back of your tasting room there. It's on your, the symbolism there, Spicer, what's that about? It's, uh, it's uh, there's again, a long version and a short version, but it's our family crest. Um, so so we're, a, we're a family of French Huguenots. Uh, a fair amount of the Villiers has arrived in South Africa during that period, but we arrived in 1685, if not, I'm not mistaken. Um, and uh, so, so it's, it's, it just purely pays homage to, to that family tie. Um, coincidentally, you'll see much the same lamb on some of Boschendal's um, reserve wines. And um, that is because the three brothers uh, coincidentally owned Boschendal for a short period of time. Um, so that's, that's where our tenure, our experience in South African wine making started. Unfortunately, it only lasted about a generation. So this is our second stand. <laughs> uh, uh, so hopefully we can stick around for a bit longer this time around. Excellent. Well, with the uh, quality of wines that uh, Rainey is producing there, this, I think you will be around for a good while and hopefully financially it will be, it'll be good for you to stick around. Um, I love, absolutely love the nose on the Syrah. I mean, the first thing that does kind of jump out to me is, is, a, is a, a, a woody spice, but then there's also that soft cherries that, um, what we, maraschino cherries? It kind of comes through. I don't know what what should you be picking up on this. Um, don't I, embarrass I, me now and say none I, of the above that you just. Scripted. I don't like to do the scriptures, guy. It's uh, I I'm going to leave it to you. For me, when you start describing a wine, people go searching for one thing, and yeah. it's not just the one thing you should be go, you should go looking for. I know this is not the answer you want. But I'm going to leave it at that because it's a it's 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 a it's a it's a rule for myself to to when we do a tasting to not put too many descriptors in there because it's it's just it's 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 the whole package that you should be enjoying. It should be um, your nose. It should be palate. It should be finished. So well, all factory on the right track. Those are typical descriptors for Syrah. You can go with spice. You can go with cherry, sour cherry, maritino cherry. Um, I like to describe sometimes as blue fruit. It's in between strawberry and blackcurrant. You get these blueberry aromas. Um, Garik, which is the, in, in our sense, we usually talk fine balls. It gives you those kind of uh, descriptors. But I, I hope that answers and I, you. I, I get you and I, I, and I applaud you for that. And I agree with you. I, I think for me, uh, in terms of trying to share a little bit about this wine, it's for for those who are intrigued and perhaps uh, you know a little scared to try it, so we 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 want to entice them a little bit. Um, but I agree with you; we shouldn't be boxing wines at all. The, the, One the thing, thing I do want to kind of touch on: but people should be enticed with wine, and and that's why I usually don't add descriptors because then they Got say, you. "I can't, I can't smell it. I don't." Then then I can't smell. Should I be drinking wine? Then should I be wasting money on on trying to buy expensive wines? No, you, you, you should just enjoy it. Even yeah. if the bottle costs you a grand and a half, at the end of the day, you're sitting around a table, the meal is turned into a memory and you're enjoying it. It should be a finished bottle of wine at the end of the day. And that's the next part of what I wanted to ask you is your passion for food and wine. What would you suggest as a food pairing for this wine? Yeah. Or do you want to tell me you're not going to suggest that? I'm glad you asked me that question. Yeah. Uh, usually I start to yearn for something. Um, no. On a day like today, a good burger with a nice uh, a kind of barbecue sauce, pepper on top of that, um, and some proper cheddar melted over it. Uh, <laughs> like a good, oh my God, good, no, good <laughs> saucy <laughs> burger. Yo, is that uh, is that an offer at the farm? Are we able to get some uh, get our hands on some of that? Uh, bring a portable bride, we'll make a plan. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, Spicer, at least he can describe a burger. You know, he doesn't want to describe the wine necessarily, but uh, 
If you start well, a restaurant you're there, eating on burgers, you, it doesn't stop. I tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> no. I think the one thing that I that I that I quite like is that there isn't the necessarily the the traditional uh, scents or nose or bouquet on this Syrah. Uh, when I say traditional, I mean you know there's not that overwhelming leather or there's not um, necessarily tobacco. For me personally, uh, it's a it's quite an interesting evolving aroma in the in the glass, and and that's yeah, a tribute to you, so Rainier. The reason for that, I mean, our wine's longevity or, or ageability is amazing. I mean, obviously, I took over from Gunter, who was here for ten years, and he left me not a single wine which I have to kind of hide away from anyone. Um, he left me with such good wines, and the longevity of these wines. If we open at two thousand and nine. It is still so fresh. There's very little breaking for the, the, the clay color of the wine doesn't appear. It's still red with a slight tinge of orange maybe. But, but the soils that we have on the farm give us such great acidity. Um, it, just, it just, I am amazed with it. Um, I've, I've never seen it anywhere else uh, where I open a bottle that's 10 years old and, and I, I would say it's three years or five years old. Um, it, it, it's quite, it's quite amazing, and that so that freshness of the wines, which 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 adds to the elegance of, of our our Syrah style, um, just helps us so so much. For me as a winemaker, I don't have to play around too much with acidity. Um, it's it's usually very natural um, coming from the vineyard. Yes, I, I, I'm in Stellenbosch, I'm in South Africa, so I do add acid and I do make sure my pHs are healthy. But at the end of the day. It's, it's, it's easy for me to manage the asset, which then just gives me this massive amount of massive potential to mature the wines for the tannins to evolve. And it just goes into this silky velvety finish. It, hel it helps a lot. Phenomenal. You've done such a great job. And, and let, I would like to chat a little bit about the steak now, if you don't mind. Uh, Spicer, besides wine, the, the farm also produces a range of other products. You've got the burden, extra virgin olive oil, which we've touched on, and perhaps that's uh, the most widely known, but I was very intrigued, and that's why I say you're a very intriguing winery, to see that there's also, a, an, how do you pronounce it in, in French, Eau de Perfume? Eau de perfume. Yes. Do you uh, tell us more? <laughs> <laughs> yes, so I think, I think what, what we do on Clay and, and, and wine being our, probably our main way of expressing it is a homage to the terroir and the location and everything that, that mother nature provides us in the process. Um, so whether it is the olive oil of which we produce small quantities, uh, unique, really spicy, zesty blend um, um, of, of, of uh, olives that grow on the farm through to the other parfum and um, uh, verju honey made from, from hives on the farm. And now we've, we're, we're in the process of, of finalizing on, on a whole uh, bigger range of, uh, um, of, of lifestyle products, all featuring, um, uh, all made, handmade, naturally made on the farm with produce from the farm. So it's, it's basically just a continuation of the whole terroir uh, discussion that, that, that pertains to wine. It's, it's just bringing a place to life and, and giving it the opportunity to manifest in a, a bunch of really beautiful, interesting, tasty, ar aromatic experiences. I can tell, I can tell you, you know a thing or two about marketing, hey? You've got the, the language, you, you, the evocative language. It's, it's <laughs> wonderful. We call it the gift. <laughs> I, I, want to, I want to come and visit, but I know it's by appointment <laughs> only, correct? <laughs> no, 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 no. We've just expanded our tasting room. We've in, in, in employed a beautiful lady to, to, to uh, greet you at the door. Um, she's looking at me kind of like at the other side of the screen. And um, we've, 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 no, you can, you can, we always recommend kind of make an appointment and we, we can obviously go that extra, extra mile, but if you arrive at our door, we won't show you away. Okay, that's excellent. T tell us a little bit about the cupboard of curiosities. Oh gosh, it sounds like something from Harry Potter. Mm. Um, but uh, 
it is it is what it is it's a it's a cupboard full of different curiosities including the stuff we just chatted about um but if i look i mean there are cake boxes and bird houses and put fly fishing wallets to keep your flies in and pot puri and honey is and it is it right. stuff that's been been gathered from winemakers' buckies that you've put in there? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a bucky. I walk everywhere. I'm a, it's a small farm. <laughs> oh, so it's just, a, a, again, a random collection of beautiful things from the farm. It's all available um, for retail in the tasting room. Uh, okay. Some beautiful sure. hand sanitizers so that we are always co conforming to the COVID regulations. One of the most important things that we have to highlight now is that uh, all COVID protocols observed, hey? <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Um, Definitely so many reasons. Are the, yeah, I see it's looking knackered there. <laughs> <laughs> but so many reasons to visit the farm. Um, and, and, and I think before I let you go to go and uh, continue producing those wonderful reasons, We've got some quick fire questions just to wrap up. And, and these are questions that you don't have to think too deeply about. It's literally the first word that comes to mind. Um, Is that not what we've been doing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, maybe. I don't know. It's, it's up to you if you, if you want to expound upon it a little bit. I might ask you to if it's a very intriguing answer. But it's one way that we, 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 we gain a quick snapshot. And the question is for each of you. So you can literally, you know, answer. Uh, the first question would be your favorite variety to drink. I think we know what Rainey's going to say, but uh, give it a go anyway. Shiraz. Shiraz. No question about it. The same for you, Spicer. Shiraz as well, huh? Yeah, unless, unless it's really cold then it's, and, and, and I've got a fire burning, then it's capsized. Okay. Uh, Moor coffee or rooibos cappuccino? Don't you want to answer that for me? <laughs> I think uh, I think Rainy is more a Moor coffee kind of guy and Spice is the rooibos cappuccino. No, 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 no you're wrong, man. Moor coffee, both of us. That's for oh, sure. really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Bucky doesn't run without diesel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you've got to find a reason to use that honey on the farm, though. So I hope you, I hope you serve rooibos cappuccinos in your new tasting room. I'll make one specially for you when you come visit us. <laughs> yes. Uh, this, is a, this is one that I, I, I've, I've fallen upon given the new times we live in. Mask or buff? Buff. I'm a mask guy. I have masks, but I prefer the buff. There we go. Uh, barefoot. Or felt schoon with no socks? Oh, sheesh, on this farm, yeah, yes. yeah I think felt schoon with no yeah. socks. I just, barefoot is sketchy. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, those, the, the sandy soils go into that felt schoon and then you get a bit of a chafe. Huh? No, I'll go barefoot. Yeah, I'll, I'll risk the double keys. I'm a felly kind of guy. <laughs> and the, the reason why I ask uh, felt schoon with no socks is I've seen so many winemakers that don't wear them with socks. And I think, look, there's nothing wrong with fellies. I've got about four pairs myself, but yarr, I would have to put socks on to wear them. No, uh, you just do secret socks. Uh, then, you look, then you look mean. You look tough, and you but actually you're looking <laughs> after yourself. <laughs> uh, last one, picnic or braai? Braai. Yeah, you can do both at the same time. That's the wonderful thing. Very true, actually. The, the ladies can be busy with a picnic and the mana can be busy with a bra. Market place. <laughs> Excellent. Well, get along to Liquor City Claremont to buy some Wordscliff wines. And if you fancy your luck, then answer the easy question that we're going to post here on the Via the Grapevine page. And you could win a mixed case of their wines. That's two Tambourskloof Syrah, two Tambourskloof Viennier, and two Tambuskluf Rosé. Plus, they're also offering you a free tasting for two people at the tasting room with the very beautiful and attractive young lady that's running it, with a cellar tour included. And that, I presume, would be with Rainy. And the uh, total value of that prize is well over a 1,000 Rand. So very, very nice prize. Thank, thank you, uh, Spicer de Villiers, for that. And uh, Rainy Oersthuizen, Thank you for your time and your energy today and the, and, and, and the best of success to you with, with Harvest. I believe, you are you still busy with that? No, I haven't even started. So 
Yeah, I've still got another six weeks, at least. Okay. Well, let the let the sleepless nights be be good and kind to you, and all the best of luck to both of you. Thanks, guys. Uh, thanks for having us. This via the grapevine was brought to you by Liquor City Claremont. Visit their wine emporium for a journey via the grapevine.